This is Women for Gun Rights with your host, Amanda Suffolk, part of the DC Project. Here we go. Can you hear me now? I have something going on on one of those screens, and so it was crazy. And um, yeah, so he, so here we go. I typically try to introduce our guest in um, one screen and then go to the other, but you're gonna see her right here. So Teresa Einacker is our guest from New Jersey. And there is so much stuff that is happening in New Jersey that we had to circle back around and um and touch it as part of women for gun rights because there is just so much news and information coming out of new jersey right now who would have thought that new jersey was such a uh, controversial gun state really in um in 2021 so hey teresa thanks for joining me hi amanda thanks for having me so nice to see you Oh yeah, it's it's good to see you, man. We're we're actually back at the spot where we get to move around and see people as opposed to solely doing it via screen. But um, but today we'll settle for screen. So um, why don't you tell folks a little bit about a little bit about you and um, and how you got involved with uh, firearms in New Jersey. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm an attorney in New Jersey. I'm admitted to practice in New York and New Jersey and the Supreme Court of the United States. I've always had an interest in constitutional rights. Um, you know, I was on the Constitutional Law Journal when I was in law school. So I've always been drawn to that. And uh, when I applied for a permit to purchase my own firearm in New Jersey, I realized what a disaster the permitting system was. And it sort of caught my attention that I needed to look into this a little bit deeper. And I come to find out there are so many administrative hurdles and other problems here that it really caught my attention. And so I joined some of the state groups. We have so many active state groups here. And, you know, soon became part of the, the leadership there. And I've been doing it ever since. Well, and that it's it's so great. I mean, this is one of the beauties, I think, of the DC Project is that there are gals that have from all different walks of life, from all different career paths. And um, so our resources within the, the DC Project are amazing. And so when we get to like Supreme Court cases, you're our go to because you understand it so much better than the rest of us. I mean, it was it was this year, I guess, when, or maybe, maybe the end of last year, when I found, when I understood what the what the term moot and the case being moot meant, and um, there's so many of these kind of Supreme Courtish words that are used, and 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 they just kind of blow right past them, and the rest of us are going, wait, wait, what, what, what does that mean? So why don't we talk a little bit about um, New York State Rifle and Pistol to the New York City, the last case that was deemed moot. What happened and how did that happen? And why is that not going to happen with the Bruin case? Sure. So in the original New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case you're talking about, it was a case that arose out of Manhattan and the city itself had restricted folks from traveling to go to the range and to go to a second home or that kind of thing. And so it was challenged. And once it looked like the court actually took an interest in dealing with it, what happened was New York City decided to play, um, you know, play, play games and said, well, we'll, oh, hold on, we'll change the law, okay? People have to understand when a case goes to the Supreme Court and a decision is issued by the court, by precedent, it actually becomes law of the land and it applies across the country. It applies everywhere. So New York City was about to set up, you know, and, and have a case that would have affected people in New Jersey and other states uh, where we are oppressed as well. So I guess they decided that it was too dangerous to do that. It wasn't going to go their way. So they said, we'll just change the law. We'll change the law. So 
midway, they changed the law. Uh, doesn't change the fact that the petitioners still had their civil rights violated mm -hmm. um, along the way. You know, the, what is, where's their, you know, uh, where's the justice for that? And anyway, so they changed the law. And of course, then the court said, oh, well, they changed the law. So this court, you know, decides that this is moot now. And and that's not an issue. So, but we know how politicians play games. They're just going to turn around and change the law and put it right back the way it was when nobody's looking, you know. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, you know. So that's why that was moot because the the city decided to change the law at the last minute. But you do see cases settle and other things happen along the way when there's litigation. Um, and and we've had similar problems in New Jersey where people have applied for permits and their rights have been violated and they go higher and higher and it looks like it's getting really good and all of a sudden they issue the permit to the guy okay right. so that it renders it moot because what he's asking for the relief he's asking for has been granted so uh, Bruin is a little bit different it's uh you know the the rifle and pistol association uh entity is involved there are i believe two at least two petitioners from upstate new york who are, you know, asking for, um, you know, their permits. And one was given a conditional permit, I believe. He, he expressed some special need that he had to and from work. So he has uh, a permit to carry, I think, in, you know, to and from work because of the conditions in the parking lot at his work. But the issue is still that he has applied to carry in general, in general public, like 43 other states do, right? Um, and so uh, that issue is still pending even though he has that partial permit. It's, it's crazy. So on Wednesday, on Wednesday, they met and um, there, the Supreme Court accepted testimony. So I am sure that you watched it. So, so fill us in on what was said and, and that kind of a thing. What did you find extremely interesting of this case? Sure. So what happened this week was what they call oral arguments. This is where each side has their attorneys present their case. And so they don't really take on new witnesses or anything, but the attorneys get to argue and field questions from the justices. And I have to say, it was extremely lively. I mean, right out of the right out of the gate, Justice Thomas started asking questions. So um, it was it was incredible. And you could see where some of them maybe are leaning and they, some of the questions they ask give you a little insight into what they're what they care about, what they're worried about, um, or whatever point they're trying to make. So oral arguments were had. There was a Paul Clement for the petitioners. That's the pro 2A side. And then you had a woman, I believe it's Barbara Underwood for uh, New York and uh, Brian Fletcher for the Biden administration. They were given an opportunity to chime in as well. So it was really two against one, but uh, Mr. Clement did much better than the other side, despite them having two. So <laughs> that was good. Um, and also, you can't really watch it uh, live, but you can listen to the oral arguments. They they do record the audio, and then lately they've been allowing it to be broadcast live. So it was a, a verbal, you know, you, you had to listen to it. And I took some notes, and of course, sometimes you weren't sure who was doing the talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and that once you sort out the voices and or someone will address the justice by his or her name, you know. Okay. So it... It was interesting. The um, Second Amendment Foundation put out a press release and they truly believe that this case is going to uh, is going to change the Second Amendment law across the nation and that the pro 2A people are going to uh, be vindicated or are going to win are going to I don't know what the word exactly is but it'll be a positive impact on the second amendment world so what what are your thoughts yes yeah, so I agree with that assessment too we have you know in states like New Jersey and parts of New York and, and some other states they don't really recognize that the second amendment applies outside the home they don't recognize that you have a right to self-defense outside the home and I know people in 43 states think that's ridiculous and absurd and it and it is so but this is what we're we're fighting under and so i believe that actually the state of new york did concede that the second amendment does apply outside the home for self-defense so we're already we've already gained a little something you know they haven't even ruled yet and we've gained we know that they're 
probably going to, um, you know, they're going to write that into their opinion. They're going to go from that, hopefully anyway, this, right. Mm -hmm. I'm being optimistic. Um, and so, yes, it, it looks like we're already going to get some recognition. And for people like me in New Jersey, that's a great first step because we don't even have that. Okay. We fight, uh, Heller has been destroyed in the clear. They supply it as the petitioner's attorney said during oral argument that lower courts have muddled Heller. Okay. The, that was his word exactly. And that is the truth. We mm -hmm. tried to fight using Heller to get some recognition about this individual right about, you know, self-defense. And so um, lots, lots of issues there. So I think there's progress on that front. I also believe from some of the questioning, uh, there was deep, deep questioning about the differences between rights in a rural area and rights in a high density area. And so it brings out the idea of do people in different jurisdictions have different constitutional rights? I mean, this is, this is absurd. I mean, all the people in the highly dense area have the exact same rights as everyone in the rural area, right? Um, so there was actually a lot of debate and a lot of questions about that, which really surprised me. Um, Chief Justice Roberts surprised me when he asked the question, how many muggings happened in the forest? And, you know, it was like, wow, you know, I, so it was, it was incredible. Um, and I believe it was Justice Alito also said, the idea of having to uh, find out in advance when you're going to be attacked or when you have a special need for self-defense is absurd because a mugger doesn't say to you, I'm going to mug you on Thursday, right? That was another line from the oral argument. Oh, wow. and, and the justices, they were on fire, man. I'm telling you, it was great. So uh, yeah, I'm going to mug you on Thursday. Uh, another issue came up of uh, sensitive places. What, what are sensitive places? So can you carry uh, in the subway system in New York City? That was up for some debate. And of course, then the question came out, well, there are already guns on the subways, right? You know, how many, how many illegal firearms have been, uh, you know, seized by NYPD? And of course, New York didn't have an answer for that. Uh, you know, just a recognition by some of the justices that, you know, the realities of the world, basically, that there are illegal guns out there. So that was great for questioning as well. Um, they were asking about proving a need in advance to a government official. And to me, this is sort of the core of the entire obstacle that we have in New York when you have to prove you know, proper cause in New Jersey. Uh, we have to prove justifiable need. I actually have to prove a specific need in advance in order to get a carry permit here. And so, as you say so eloquently, you know, your attacker gets to choose the time and the place and the manner he's going to attack you, right? How am I supposed to articulate that in advance? <laughs> right, right. How, right, so uh, that was a core, a core issue that was also talked about. And uh, it was, it's very interesting because what other constitutional right has to be proven in advance to a government official who uses discretion to decide if you meet that or not. No other one, even, even Justice Sotomayor asked that question. She asked you know, that question about what other constitutional right is treated this way. So I think even for the justices who may not want to rule in favor of, of Carrie outside the home in mm -hmm. this case, I think they recognize there are some very bad weaknesses uh, with the other, you know, with the non 2 a argument. So I, it's, the, the part that's going to, to hurt us is the fact that we've got to wait six to eight months before we hear the answer to any of this. Yes, that's true. It, we should hear by June of this year, uh, June of next year, excuse me. That that right. will be, I know, right? What year are we in anyway? Right. <laughs> uh, by June of, June of 2022, we should have a decision. And I am going to say, you know, after that, I think we may even be left with more questions than we have answers. So okay. does the government get to decide what places you can carry? Can you go, okay, into a school? Can you go to a football stadium? You know, the questions were asked in oral argument. What about Yankee Stadium? What about uh, the campus of NYU? What about the campus of Columbia? What about Giant Stadium, right? Can you carry in these places? Uh, Justice Breyer, who definitely is uh, he you know talked about not agreeing with heller okay so he's coming right out and there's no bones about how he feels mm -hmm. about it 
he said, even if you're of good moral character, what happens when you start drinking alcohol? You know, we're going to end up with gun related chaos. Uh, chaos was his word. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you know, attorneys for petitioners tried to say, well, that doesn't happen in the 43 other states. This is not some novel idea that is not practiced anywhere. OK, um, so, yeah, how they how they're going to be able to get past that, I don't know. <laughs> It should be it should be really interesting. So right now, everybody is talking about the Supreme Court case, even though we're going to be waiting for the next eight months before we hear anything. But oh, there you go. But so, folks, you've just now gotten at least a snapshot of what hopes and dreams are available to us from the Supreme Court in hearing a Second Amendment case, because they have not really heard a Second Amendment case. It was Heller, it was McDonald, it was Azal, and then I don't think it's, I don't think they've heard anything since then. So um, 2008, 2010, 2011, somewhere right in there. So it has been, it has been a, a double handful of years since the Supreme Court has taken on any Second Amendment case that has any meaning to us because without it being pitched back, tossed, whatever, back to it. So so let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about New Jersey uh, politics because New Jersey, New Jersey politics then impact New Jersey gun laws. And so, so you had, um, you had quite a shakeup. I don't know that it's it's shaken one way or another because I think it's still in recount. But um, what's as a boots on the ground? What's what's going on in New Jersey? Yeah, so we had a pretty interesting election day, and it's actually not over yet here. Um, the biggest story so far would be that our long-standing Senate president Steve Sweeney he has been in power for a long time. He's been really a, a you know, very difficult uh, person when it comes to uh, Second Amendment issues. You know, we've testified many times in the Senate uh, trying to knock back some bills that he supported. Uh, he was actually unseated by a non-politician, by a conservative truck driver. His name is Edward Durr. He, uh, he just ran on a very limited campaign, limited uh, funds. I think his only video campaign video was like from his iPhone. Uh, and he had a limited budget up against a million dollar guy and he and he beat him. I believe they called the race yesterday or today. So so how have... did so how did he do that? What did his campaign look like in order to take on the machine from a grassroots standpoint? Right. I know that he he knocked on doors. I believe he had, you know, his local people and his his supporters knocking on doors and basically on the ground. And, and the environment here is, is really against, you know, the lockdowns. We've been suffering with lockdowns, and mandates, and all kinds of crazy things. And, you know, Project Veritas actually had several videos over the last few weeks of uh, Governor Murphy's campaign saying that he was waiting for the election and then he's coming up with mandates and people are against these mandates. And so people just got out to the polls. They got out to the polls and um, and really, you know, really knocked him down. So Murphy is actually in a, you know, very close within a percentage out of, I believe, 2.4 million votes. They're less than a percentage off. So and all the votes haven't been counted yet. There were some irregularities being reported that are being investigated. So I believe that it was probably a top down sort of thing. But uh, Steve Sweeney was the Senate president. He did not stop Murphy. You know, he didn't stand up. We were saying where's the legislature here you know murphy's getting out of control he's doing these things that he has no right to do we need our our representatives to stand up and say you know enough with this and sweeney's actually was very powerful and could have had an impact but he's he's not uh he just didn't get involved so uh i guess the response in his district was we are done with you as well and we don't want mandates and so they elected this you know this brand new guy off the street, which is fantastic. And actually, uh, Mr. Durr had applied for a carry permit and had been denied. So he has been engaged and in touch with uh, Second Amendment issues in this state as well. So uh, I believe he may have said in an interview that was the driver that got him interested in getting involved. And it's fantastic. It's just so it's so great to see. 
That that is amazing. And so so in the Murphy race, uh, at what point may and maybe maybe I'm asking a question that you don't have an answer to. At what point do they do an automatic recount? Is it a half a percent? Is it one percent? Because it's a race that is really really close and. Um, so do you know when they're going to, if they're going to do a recount or if they're just continuing to count the, uh, the ballots that are coming in, like the mail-ins from the military, the mail-ins from, you know, that type of a thing? Right. I, I don't know what the statistical requirement is that triggers that. I don't know if we even have a statute that triggers that. But I do know that uh, Jack Chitterelli's campaign, he came out and he said, you know, they have not given up. They're not conceding. It's, it's too close. They're waiting for all of the county clerks and, and for the, uh, you know, whoever's mm-hmm. in charge of the Board of Elections, for them to all uh, provide the official numbers before they do anything. But I do believe they have a large, you know, group of attorneys that are coming in. They're getting national help from the GOP. And so I expect, definitely expect litigation to be filed. Mm-hmm. There, there are definitely some, you know, allegations of, you know, the, the whole thing again, you know, the, the electronic machines, the Wi-Fi didn't work. People were, I, I personally know someone who went in to vote and the card didn't work and he was told to just fill out this paper and some people were given Sharpies to fill out the paper, some people were given pens mm. and there was a little bit of chaos and it looked like, you know, who knows where that went to and if it'll ever be counted. And so I think that, um, you know, you're going to see stories upon stories. There's a video floating around of a woman in an electronic machine trying to vote for Cittarelli. It won't press for him. It presses for Murphy, um, that sort of thing. And so who investigates that? I don't know. You know, Murphy certainly doesn't want that investigated. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Jack Cittarelli and, and the GOP, they need to they definitely need to make sure that this gets looked at um, and analyzed. And I don't care how long it takes. It needs to be done right. Mm-hmm. Because this is really, really important. You know, this guy, Murphy, he wants to impose all kinds of mandates, you know, against our children and everything with schools. He's mandated all sorts of things. Uh, You know, the first act he ever did when he got into office was the 10 round magazine limit. And so he's always had an issue with with gun owners. I'm sure he'll probably come swinging out with something else if he's in again another four years. So it's really important that this gets done right. And okay. I think it's great because New Jersey people write us off, you know, oh, it's a blue state. You'll never it'll never be a red state. And actually, you know, I think it's more red than people give credit to. You know, we have sections where highly dense, densely populated sections where are very, very, uh, you know, densely blue. But a lot of the state is very rural. And that might be hard for people to believe because it's not what mm-hmm. they think of when they watch you know the sopranos or something like that but you guys are called the garden state for a reason because you are rural and beautiful yes yeah i happen to live in the pine barren so you know it's it's a it's a rather rural area and so it's very it's just really great to see people standing up i have a personal friend who ran for board of education in town and so these people really have had enough of these these tyrants and Mm -hmm. of course as gun owners we know we're like welcome to the welcome to the party you know we already know they're always you know trying to push another law against us another mandate trying to trying to take our rights even more and more and so it's really refreshing to see people you know get involved and be be you know really into uh the process it's fantastic it really is so it if if ohio is an example to New Jersey, because I, I believe that most states work somewhat like this. The Board of Election meets periodically and will have to meet to certify the election and may potentially meet another time in between. And those are open meetings. So the Open Meetings Act um, applies and you can actually attend the meetings. So you get to see what they're doing and what they're looking at. And so when someone is told, okay, this is not working, fill out this paper, that's a provisional ballot. And so that provisional ballot then goes back to the Board of Election and the Board of Election confirms that that person did not vote already. And then they they will accept the provisional ballot. Um, And you can actually, you can contact your local Board of Election 
find out when their meetings are and attend them. So you could attend in New Jersey, I believe, all of the different boards of election meetings between now and when the ballot, when the vote is certified, which may be a great thing for all of like the, um, you know, CNJFO, if they have folks in, in different places, just someone showing up to the board of election and having them explain what they're doing and how they're doing it for each thing. It's because it is a nonpartisan board, there are Republicans and Democrats. So, so they have a, so they have a balance and everybody within that board, um, works on that balance. So, so they, they move together with a Republican and a Democrat, that, that type of thing. And so seeing that in action and then understanding some of the things that have happened in the election and what that repercussion is within, within the board and then with, to the, to the election itself is kind of interesting. Yeah, that sounds great. I, I think there are some allegations that there were, you know, people who were not citizens were permitted to vote at Project Veritas had uh, released a video yesterday that that was happening in a certain county. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an allegation that 65 of the machines were shut off in another county uh, before polling was, you know, ended. And, and so those are those are the kind of issues that mm -hmm. I, I don't know that a recount is really going to address those if, you know, there, there was some sort of investigation that needs to happen. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. And it would be incumbent on Chiarelli's campaign to make, you know, that decision. Right. He's the mm -hmm. one that's the candidate. And so we just have to sit back and wait and see what he does and what his team decides to do. Um, and we're you know, not good we're, waiters. We don't wait well. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> We do very true. Not, we do not <laughs> wait well. It's like this is killing me, right? That kind of a thing. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I I had seen so many statements telling people, okay, well, because Murphy was was reelected, um, to move, just give up, walk away, move. And, um, and I want you to give your most persuasive argument as to don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and why do you stay and fight? Right, absolutely. So I hear this all the time. People always talk about, well, if you don't like the gun laws in that state, why don't you just move? And I moved and it's great here and I got my carry permit. And it's like, well, you know, actually I can foresee a future where if we don't stop the tyrants from violating our civil and constitutional rights here, that that will spread to those other states that are free, especially as people move from states like New Jersey into those freer states, they bring their ideals and their principles with them. Next thing you know, you know, they don't like that you can carry in public. So maybe they're not going to renew their carry permits and that sort of thing. So if we don't fight here in states like New Jersey and New York, like we continue to constantly file cases. We're always on, you know, on the attack in litigation. If we don't do that, eventually these problems are going to spread elsewhere. And so in a way, instead of telling us to move, they should be saying, thank you for holding the line there because I don't want it to come here, you know? Um, so I, moving is not a, a problem. I mean, I don't run away from my issues, you know? <laughs> you have to face them. Somebody has to do it, my goodness. And if, if we all just keep running away from it, then they get away with it and we don't allow them to get away with it. So we right. do what we have to do to to make it as difficult as possible for them. So we may not be winning in court all the time, but we have to make it as difficult as possible for them to do this. Otherwise, they'll just go and take other rights from us. And as we see, you know, as we have seen over the last two years, you know, how easily it's been. Well, now you can't go out of your house past eight o'clock at night or you can't do whatever. And uh, this is in part because they're emboldened by violating other rights, like 2A rights. So moving is not an option. Somebody has to fight. Yeah. Well, I think you're a, you're a bumper sticker that says, if not me, then who? And so it's yeah. going to be you. Yes, that is so true. Absolutely. I'm, I'm actually very optimistic with the New York case. I think this is going to make a huge difference. And we have filed so many carry cases coming out of New Jersey and CNJFO is involved in another carry case that's pending. 
-hmm. right now in a federal district court um, with the with the states, um, you know, NRA affiliate ANJ RPC. We're also involved with the Farms Policy Coalition on a permitting, uh, the, the entire permitting uh, scheme that we have for purchasing any kind of gun, even you know handguns, but also for to purchase a rifle or a shotgun. The process is broken, and so we have a lawsuit pending with them as well. And there's another lawsuit pending over the 10-round magazine limit, and that has been pending since 2018. So uh, if the New York case does not resolve that issue, you know, are they going to come out and say, OK, you can carry outside the home, but the state can tell you you can only carry 10 rounds. You know, I, they're not probably going to say that. That's not really the issue in that case. So we're going to have to continue because the states will turn around and say, OK, you can carry outside the home. This will be New Jersey. I can just see it now. But you can only carry one round. You can only have two rounds. OK, because, you know, the court didn't say that we couldn't do that. And so then we'll have to file another lawsuit. And, you know, if this other if this other mag lawsuit doesn't go further. So it's it's never going to end. It's just sort of like the beginning of new new conflicts that we're going to have about this. There you go. It's going to be the Barney Fife rule. One bullet. <laughs> you got to keep it in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> He's still got more than I've got right now. So. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, hey, a couple weeks ago, you were out of town doing something amazing with uh, 40, 50 other women. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the State Leader Summit that took place for the DC Project? Oh my goodness, this was a great time. So we met in Florida at the very first uh, state directors a summit for the DC project. It was at Big Daddy Unlimited in Florida. Thank you to them. It was a fantastic facility and it was so well run. I mean, it was just fantastic. And we learned and we trained each other and we got to know each other. And we did these wonderful exercises with each other and learned so much. And it was just so valuable to see everyone face to face and it's different than seeing people online, right? I've, I've mm -hmm. been Facebook friends and, and friends on, you know, for, for how long? And I've never met these people. So to meet people from all over, California, Arizona, Missouri, you know, Utah, it was just fantastic for us to get together and to see what we have in common and how we're different also. And it was just mm -hmm. this incredible time. It was wonderful. And I learned so much. I am privileged to be a part of this group. I'm telling you, it really is. It's just fantastic. I, I that's that's how I feel about the DC project itself. You know, there are there are so many women that are involved in the DC project, and then there's so many women that are resources to the DC project, and then are on the perimeter. And that's really one of the things that we that we touch on on this show is that though we do interview a lot of DC project women, we interview some who are supports to and are doing something amazing in their area, in their area of expertise, that kind of a thing. But because there are so many amazing DC project gals, it just makes it so easy. Um, and I was unable to attend and I, um, I it, it broke my heart not to be there. But um, there's just so much stuff that I got to see coming out of there. And um, just watching the, the education and watching the, the connections that happened to tell folks how, how to interact, how to work with their legislators, how to use the resources from one state to another state so that your state um, can touch a different or that you can use Gain, ground gained from another state as a resource for your state and um, so who did you by the by the end of it you kind of connected with a couple different states what are the states that that kind of resonated or connected with you well I was really happy to meet Gina Roberts from California Gina you know she, she really helped us getting around uh, you know rides to the airport mm -hmm. And having those conversations in the vehicle, fantastic. Just a wealth of knowledge. And just, it's amazing when you get to meet people in person and talk to them, get to know their personalities, get to learn a little bit about 
what other kinds of activities they do. They're into politics and they're into civic organizations. So you understand like the different, like sort of like the degrees and the depth of people that she was fantastic. Um, I got to meet uh, Susan from Missouri. She mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, just, you know, going by herself, you know, to her state capital. And that was fantastic. I mean, that's not easy to do. So that was, that was great sitting near her. Um, I met a new person, Mary from Connecticut. Uh, along with Holly Sullivan, of course, and Mary has a very compelling story. And so to hear her very compelling self-defense story was really moving and to really put, uh, you know, faces to the experiences and understand how important the work really is. It is really, really important. And so it was, you know, everybody was fantastic, but, um, you know, getting to know some of them better, it was just, it was fantastic. It really was. It was great. Well, and when you tie like a state of Missouri, which is really fairly, as Charlie Cook says, free America, and then you compare that to New Jersey or California and you see the differences, it's pretty amazing to me watching because I know that Susan Myers is going, well, you know, my legislature wants to work with me. What, what, where are the areas that we could gain ground or advance or, or work on? And it's like, wow, if you're from New Jersey, you're from California, you're from Connecticut, you can't even imagine how free Missouri is and the things that they already have as you create um, a checklist for her to continue to work forward. Yes, it, it's interesting. We're all sort of like in varying degrees of freedom here. And, you know, I, as as the uh, petitioner in the New York State uh, Rifle and Pistol Association oral arguments, he said, we want to have what they're having. Okay. When he was talking about free America, we want to have what they're having. That's all we want, right? right? So that is exactly what we want, right? We want to have what you're having. So these constitutional carry states, you know, you compare that all the way down to a state like mine that won't issue carry permits. And, you know, it's May issue, but seriously, less than one one hundredth of a percent of gun owners can get one. So uh, it, it's it's really a it's a different experience for everyone. Some mm -hmm. of them have positive experiences, and the laws are different too. You know, our sheriffs in New Jersey have no power really to do anything, but sheriffs in other states have mm -hmm. great powers to do things, right? And to enforce law or not enforce law, that sort of thing. Um, sanctuary sanctuary towns and cities and counties. We actually have a sanctuary movement here in New Jersey and many towns, including my own town, is a second amendment sanctuary. But, you know, when it comes down to it, they don't really have the authority to grant me a carry permit. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, but it, it sends a message anyway. So we constantly have to check ourselves here, I think, to make sure we're not only on the defense. I, I think we're always on the defense. Oh no, another bill came, there's 40 bills mm -hmm. pending, the five round mag bills pending, we gotta do something about that. You know, the red flags, all these things. And so we're always on the defense and trying to fight them off. But what can we do to be actually on the offense? You know, and that's that's really challenging for us. It really is. Um, so it's it's great to learn from everybody else. And I think that that's a very good point. Um, Thomas Massey, who is part of this, who is uh, the co-chair of the Second Amendment Caucus, he's he asks for us, for all of us Americans to reach out to the Second Amendment Caucus with ideas for gun bills to be on the offense and to to be able to put those out. And he's like, if we can put them together, he will, he will gladly sponsor them because otherwise we just allow the erosion and we're just backed up, backed up, backed up, backed up. And so if we can kind of hold the line or cause cause the anti-gunners to have to back up. That's kind of one of the things that we're hoping for. Absolutely, that's great. And I think if people do have like, you know, ideas for that, that they ought to definitely put them in the chat and they should reach out to, to him for that. Again, with the sanctuary movement here in New Jersey, it's, it's definitely one of the ways that we can do it. It may not have the legal effect that we want, but it is going on the offense. And you know, we as CNJFO and with the other state groups, we we banded together and wrote a letter to every member of the assembly, every member of the Senate, to Murphy, to the superintendent of 
state police and also to the attorney general that we were not going to tolerate their delays anymore with the permitting system and that we were tired of them dragging their heels on NICs. We want you know, the state of New Jersey to get out of that. They're a middleman. They're not a direct report state. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, we and they have, you know, the, the wait times have improved. They moved into a digital system now so that your permits are are uh, issued digitally instead of them being paper copies that were already days behind by the time you picked them up because they forgot to call you. And so they tightened up the system a little bit. Um, and, and so just going on the we're making demands, like, let's just start making demands about what we want. And so I'm, I'm definitely open to more ideas about how to go on the offense, uh, you know, other than filing the litigation that we have, that is completely mm-hmm. on the offense. And, you know, just to hold their feet to the fire and to start making those phone calls and hold them accountable for the stupid, stupid bills that they, they draft um, in a, the assembly. And, you know, right. we uh, have... It's, it's kind of crazy because it, it is this thing where everybody wants to stop um, they want to stop abuse. They want to stop uh, violent attacks. They want to stop evil. But there's different ways to go about it, and there's different mindsets. And so some just think that they can legislate evil away, and others think that it's my job to protect myself, and, uh, and there's not going to be a policeman as well-intended as they are anywhere near me in the in the event that that I need assistance. So so right. what do you think? Right. I actually think it might not sound like it, but we have more in common with people with the aunties in the sense that we're against violence. Now, of course, they use that term of our gun violence. And my response is, but why are you OK with other forms of violence? Right. It's mm-hmm. for us. We're against violence as well. So that is that is something we have in common. We definitely disagree about how to go about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have to we you know, we must be vigilant because these people want to disarm us. You know, they want total civilian disarmament. And so as much as I'd like to find common ground with them, as long as that is their goal, you know, that's that's going to be really difficult to achieve. But, you know, we're against abuse. We're against violence. We just think that uh, the solution for us is better. You know, educating people is the right way to go, not disarming people. Mm -hmm. And so we just disagree about the solution for it. And I wish that they would actually be willing to talk to us more about it. But, you know, that's that's difficult to do. Um, And we do. I have spoken with assembly people who have drafted anti 2 a bills and and they've said, wow, I I didn't know that was what the impact would be. Um, You know, they they hear red flag. They think it's a great thing. Wow. You know, you can stop somebody from doing something. So, of course, they're going to vote for it. Mm -hmm. It looks like a great little thing on their uh, political flyers every few years. And but, you know, well, you just did away with due process. Now, you're you know, it's been abused. I know of at least two cases where the red flag has been already abused in New Jersey and the people did have their gun rights restored by courts because they were being abused. Um, But at what cost? Right. At great cost. At great, great cost. And and it's also that non-personal cost. It's a cost to all of us. As as you dilute civil rights for people and you dilute due process, someday that's going to be you. Someday that's going to be against your loved ones. Or, you know, even in the future, future generations are not going to have the same concepts of due process that we have and it's really not for us to give it away it's it's for us to to fight to maintain i I really believe that so Mm -hmm. yes the cost is not only the cost in the legal fees and the aggravation and the embarrassment and all the things that go with it you know maybe they lost their jobs over it um you know one individual was a guy who wrote a uh, bad review of a doctor online all right. And the doctor red flagged him. This man eventually ended up getting his guns back, but he had to go to court. It was it was a terrible situation for him. Uh, and it was it was it was used improperly. Let's face it. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, and when, when you look at the court and, and the legal fees, I I know somebody that, that we both we both share a knowledge of that had was arrested for not brandishing their gun, for not touching their gun, for not getting their gun out, but solely for saying 
to a guy who was who was climbing up onto his vehicle with the intent to cause him bodily harm, he said to this guy, hey, dude, don't. I have a gun. And that was all that was said. No, you did not see the gun. He did not get it out. He did not point it. Nothing. The police were called. He was arrested and spent time in jail. And then it took him thousands, thousands of dollars in in legal fees to clear his name. Yes. Yes, lives get ruined. You know, that's all it takes is one encounter with the police. And, and I've ha- you know, heard of many cases of people who were just, you know, oh, people would say, oh, I don't have to worry about that because they'll never come for me. Well, something happens. Something happens at your house and the police show up and they see something in plain view. And the next thing you know, you're going to jail. And so um, it's, it's really a, it's very costly and the aggravation and the stress on the person and how it affects other parts of their lives and their families, they mm-hmm. can destroy lives. And actually, this is one of the real fears we have for red flag. Again, we have, we have extreme risk protection orders already here mm-hmm. in New Jersey that circumvent due process. And I know there's talk about it on a national level. People better wake up because, you know, if your neighbor doesn't like you, all it takes is a phone call. OK, you know, if you write a bad review of a doctor, all it takes is a phone call or maybe your family member is mad at you about something. All it takes is a phone call. And next thing you know, you're having all your guns seized and, and you're going to court to justify yourself. So well, uh, it is I'm, it is a risk. It, yeah. it's, it's an unfortunate risk to be a gun owner, especially in a, a state like this. We have a heightened risk for that. And um, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, we're constantly under threat of being, you know, we're conflated with criminals. OK, so just like in that instance where the person is in, in a defensive manner saying I have a gun, it's it's putting yourself at risk because you're bearing all the risk of having that firearm. You're, we're bearing all the risk of that. And we're conflated with criminals all the time. Even the Supreme Court did it the other day. There were justices on there completely conflating lawful, constitutional, you know, law abiding gun owners with people who create gun chaos, people who engage in violence, people who are out of control. And they they like to just mix us up with that and throw us all into one batch. And it's very unfortunate. But hopefully if we can get some really good case law out of the SCOTUS on this, some of that will stop. But red flag is going to be the next Mm -hmm. the next step. And I know there are several challenges pending through our courts as well about the lack of due process. Right. And then right after red flag is going to be serialized and non-serialized or as they call it, ghost guns, um, because that's that's going to be another issue. And um, the crazy part about the they'll call it they've already coined the term. They're using the term when um, we allowed the term to be created and used assault weapon when it's really a modern sporting rifle and we didn't push yeah. back ghost gun is yeah. going to be another one of those most most people don't realize that firearms manufactured before 1968 did not mm-hmm. have a serial number or did were not required to have a serial number and in some cases if they did have a serial number that serial number was reused on a on a on a rotating basis so there were multiple guns out in pop population circulation with the same serial number 1968 is when the unique serial number came out but um they're going to use they're going to use ghost guns so that they can in effect make out all the guns manufactured before 1968 plus all guns manufactured now individually by a person they're going to make them they're going to go after them to make them all illegal What's your thought? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. And New Jersey has been, you know, signaling this for uh, well over a year now We've, with two different attorneys general in our state. So mm-hmm. there has been a lawsuit about, you know, 3D printing. And, um, you know, actually, we got dragged into a court in Texas. Our attorney general at the time thought that, you know, he was going to win. And, and uh, the, a company in Texas decided to sue them. And uh, the, the state tried to get out of it. And the Texas court said, nope, you know, you started this fight and you're going to stay in this fight. And so we were like, yes, this is great. 
um, because they kind of picked a fight where they shouldn't have. And mm -hmm. I've noticed, uh, we have a new attorney general right now, but I've noticed on all of their social media posts, there's always a reference to a ghost gun. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. we've done a gun buybacks, which is a whole other, you know, misuse of language. They're right. all illegal transfers. Let's face it. Exactly. It's okay. When the government does it right. Think about <laughs> um, that. That is a, that is a no, no questions asked. Let's, let's say that's a car buyback instead. If you come and bring a car, we'll give you a gift certificate for X number of dollars. No questions asked. Just bring us a car. What's, I wouldn't <laughs> give you, I wouldn't give you my car that has a value that I know what it is, but I'd gladly give you your car, right? I'll right. Tell. That's, um, that's, wow. yeah, that's how I it's, see that. Uh, yeah. And, and so, you know, first of all, they're illegal transfers, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're not doing what they have to do. But secondly, with the no questions asked, you probably what you're going to have is, oh, that murder weapon that somebody's had laying around, they can finally get rid of it, you know, and turn it in, no questions asked. Um, mm -hmm. So, but they have been doing these gun buybacks, so-called buybacks throughout the state consistently. They've been referring to ghost guns. And I think in the last, one of the last posts they referred to, uh, either it was like an assault rifle ghost gun and ghost magazine or something like that. And I was like, what is that? What is that? You know, <laughs> every time I hear the term assault rifle, I'll say, will you define that? Will you define that or stop using that language to scare people? Okay. Right. Um, and, and we do have to tell people when they, when they try to use this language against us, just ask them what it is they're referring to. Right. What do you mean by that? And of course, then you'll see they're not able to to do that. Uh, and yes, language really matters. It's very impactful. Your words matter. And we do have to push back on that. It's 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 tolerating. And I think we're just sort of into this bad cycle of tolerating a lot mm -hmm. of this stuff. Like, oh, there they go again. Oh, now they're doing ghost guns. And so, you know, I do call them out when I see it. And I think other people should do it as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't think they should own those words. Um, smart gun, they started down the path of smart guns. So if a computerized gun is a smart gun, does that mean all the rest of the guns are stupid guns? And, <laughs> you know, yeah. and so most of us, if they use the term computerized gun, we all are understand the, the internet, you know, recalculating the blue circle of, of death you know that you're right that right. it's trying to figure out what's going on and you just have to wait or reboot or whatever and so when you're right. looking for in in a self-defense gun a, a computerized gun that was going to be government mandated that would potentially have to recalculate or wouldn't know where it's at or wouldn't be able to function until it reset itself how how safe is that? It's not safe at all. And actually, New Jersey's had a smart gun bill, you know, forever um, proposed there, just hanging out there, you know, lording over us as with the other 42 other bills that are always uh, pending against us. Uh, they don't really care. Really, at the end of the day, they've already demonstrated that your life doesn't matter to them or my life doesn't matter or my child's life doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that everything they do, it, it goes with that, that mindset straight off the bat. So, uh, no, I, we're not giving control to something that the government can just shut off whenever they feel like it. It's not going to happen. So they right. need to understand that there are limits and they're reaching the limits. Okay. So, um, sure. no, it's, it's a hard no. Okay. <laughs> right. As my mother used to say, I've had it up to here. <laughs> yes, I have heard that one too, believe me. <laughs> right. Yeah, we've had it up to here. And maybe we, they're getting a little taste of that, you know, now. Right. They're starting to understand. So, yes, that is a no-go. Um, please. Right. I mean, you might as well just give everything up then because the government will be able to control uh, everything as it is. They want more and more control over you. And uh, that has to be, you have to check them. We have to keep them in check. And mm -hmm. even if you don't win every case and you don't win every battle, we have to make it as difficult as possible for them. Otherwise, they keep just keep throwing more and more and more. So right. there you yeah. go. So um, you're involved in a couple different groups. DC Project is one of them. But I so we want to kind of do as we end the show, we just want to let people know that this work 
there is it it has a cost to it and that cost is a financial cost but it is also a time and effort and energy cost and so if you've got the time and you've got the energy then get involved in the DC project and go sign up for dcproject.info and you can actually sign up and get involved if you're of the female persuasion um, but if you don't have that time or that inclination or or that drive or motivation and you do want to help then financially there are ways that you can do it and your donations small as they are um, you know every little bit helps and it helps offset the costs it the things like where Teresa and I were talking about the summit where we're educating all of the state leaders that um, that has a has a cost to it and so private donations of 10 25 100 dollars helped offset all the travel costs in getting the gals there to be able to learn so that they can go back to their home states and fight um, so what kind of plea do you want to uh, to do to folks to make a donation either to the DC project or CNJFO or you know or whatever is near and dear to your 2A heart Oh, absolutely. These two groups are my two groups. So the DC project, you have to understand we're all volunteers. You know, we're not being paid for any of this. Same thing with the state group, CNJFO. We're not being paid for this. We're giving up our time, you know, giving up a, a, my time, you know, away from my child uh, to, to do these things, to go to our capital when it's open, to make those phone calls. And it, it does take a lot of time to learn and to follow. And so you know, we're volunteering our time and it really helps us when people can help pay and defray the transportation costs when we have to go learn something. We have to learn or we need to meet at the state capitol or we need to meet in Washington, D.C. So every donation does count. You know, I, we had a fundraiser in New Jersey in May mm -hmm. and we raised a lot of money and really we did it $75 at a time. You know, it sounds kind of crazy, but that's how we did it. Just $75 at a time per ticket. And so uh, a little bit adds up and it makes a huge difference. So definitely go to dcproject.info and check that out. Sign up and get the newsletter. If you're you know, a woman who wants to volunteer, you can do that. And cnjfo.com also has a join us page. You can join, have a membership. You can make a donation. You can follow on social media and get all of the news, all of the relevant news. You need to keep up with it. There's always something afoot here in New Jersey. There's always something that needs to be done. So that is my plea. Okay, well, I appreciate that plea. So folks, um, Teresa Einacker from New Jersey, she is an amazing gal, as you can tell by this hour, and we could keep going, but we're gonna cut it off right here. And um, Teresa, thank you so much for joining on the Women for Gun Rights show. Thank you so much, you are the best. I just love working with you. Oh, there you go. Well, I appreciate that. So, okay, folks, we're going to wrap it up and um, we'll catch you again next week. This is Women for Gun Rights with your host, Amanda Suffolk, part of the DC Project.